Dear colleagues, dear friends, dear sisters and brothers, dear guests, this is an important day for all of us. It is my delight to welcome you here in this Fisetoft Hall today. On behalf of the World Council of Churches, a fellowship of churches representing 560 million Christians, including most of the world, Orthodox churches, Anglican churches, Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist, Reformed, as well as many United, Independent, and some Pentecostal churches from across the world. In this hall, we have a tapestry behind us, which is giving the identity to this hall, but also to what we are going to do today. This quotation in Greek from the Gospel of John, chapter 17, Hinapantes hen osin, that they all may be one, is the call that is behind what we are going to do to get today. And it is particularly relevant also exactly for the profile of the document we are going to present together. It is about how we are called to be one so that the world may believe, so that we can give a common witness together as the disciples of Christ, as churches, and in this world in which we all live. Particularly in a world where we are together with people of other faiths, people who have no faith or have no religious affiliation. And together we are here in this particular moment of presenting an important result of our work together. Together with me here in this, on this podium, I can introduce to you His Eminence Cardinal Turan, the President of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, and Dr. Jeff Tunicliffe, the CEO and Secretary General of the World Evangelical Alliance, and their colleagues. And we will introduce you as you will be asked to present to us your perspectives. We are happy that you could join us for what we believe marks this historical moment in our ecumenical journey. And we present to you what you have been given in your hand, Christian witness in a multi-religious world, recommendations for conduct, presented by the World Council of Churches, the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, and the World Evangelical Alliance. It is a day of thankfulness, it's a day of celebration, but also a day of reflection and sharing our prayers and our hope that this will have an impact in our churches and for the Christian witness in the world. So let me start by inviting Professor Dr. Thomas Schirmeyer, who is the Chair of the Theological Commission and Speaker on Human Rights for the World Evangelical Alliance, to give us an introduction to the process behind this document. Today we are gathered here to launch this historic document, which in itself has a history. It is the result of an intense and extensive process of five years of our collective efforts. And it has outlived in the institutions a lot of leaders and stuff, and nevertheless went on. And it also will open a new process to carry out this message in our respective constituencies in the coming days and years. As a person who has been part of the process from quite early stage, let me take the opportunity to give you an overview over this process. The question of conversion emerged as one issue to be discussed in a worldwide scale during a major interreligious event, the critical moment interreligious conference organized by the World Council of Churches in June 2005 in Geneva. There was a proposal at that time for the WCC that they needed to be much clearer on the question of religious conversion as an issue in interreligious dialogue. Hans Ucko of 
WCC's Office on Interreligious Relations and Dialogue brought the idea up in one of the yearly staff meetings between the Pontifical Council of Interreligious Dialogue and the Interreligious Relations and Dialogue of WCC. The end result was that the two offices initiated a project entitled Interreligious Reflection on Conversion from Controversy to a Shared Code of Conduct. The project was made up of three major consultations and about double as many smaller meetings of staff and experts, mostly just called the drafting committee. And an ongoing virtual discussion that later on included many Christian leaders worldwide that were asked of their evaluation of the draft. The first consultation, conversion, assessing the reality, met at Lariano, Italy in May 2006, and wanted to map the problems, and thus was an interreligious meeting. 27 people representing Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, and Yoruba religion agreed that a code of conduct for propagating one's own faith should be achieved. They stated, number three of the report, we affirm that while everyone has a right to invite others to an understanding of their faith, it should not be exercised by violating others' rights and religious sensibilities. And this sentence still is what the whole recommendations are about. After Lariano 2006, I was invited by the WCC as an expert on this particular issue to a small meeting convened here in Geneva. It was at that meeting when Hans Ucko, on behalf of the World Council of Churches, in agreement with Felix Machado of the Pontifical Council of Interreligious Dialogue invited the World Evangelical Alliance to become part of the process. This became the task of World Evangelical Alliance's Religious Liberty Commission. The second consultation, named Towards an Ethical Approach to Conversion, Christian Witness in a Multi-Religious World, which was prepared by a small group meeting in Geneva I have a nice picture here if you want to look at this uh, historic moment. Um, um, that was an um, inter-Christian meeting and took place as a larger meeting of all branches of Christianity in Toulouse, France, in August 2007 with 45 participants. It was here that the necessity of specific recommendations was discussed in length. And the topics were set out that had to be addressed in a code, as it was still called at that time. The idea would be that Christians, first of all, find a code of conduct among themselves in their relation to other religions. If even Christians would not agree amongst each other on a peaceful way for the Christian witness that respects human dignity and the right of others, how could we expect an agreement with other religions? After Toulouse, a draft committee of the three bodies involved started to work on the text of the recommendations following the topic listed in Toulouse. The text was revised again and again in discussion with the leadership and in taking re in reactions from church leaders from all over the world who got to see the text. Finally, the text was taken to a third consultation in Bangkok under the title Christian Witness in a Multi-Religious World, Recommendations for a Code of Conduct. January 2011 this year. Again, with 45 high-ranking representatives of the three bodies, plus church leaders and experts, which had the sole task to discuss and revise the text of the recommendations. In groups and in plenary, the text was discussed line by line. There were so many fine and valuable contributions that we ran out of time. It was amazing how suddenly the text finally proposed was seen as a much better text than the one we had started with at the beginning of Bangkok, both by the participants and by the institutions involved. It no longer, from my perspective, was a text with a lot of good single thoughts, but one flowing from the first sentence to the last sentence, which you might see if you read it now. After Bangkok, only very minor changes were agreed upon between the Pontifical Council, World Council of Churches, and World Evangelical Lines. During the period of the process of drafting and finalizing the document over a period of five years, there were many changes in staff and leadership 
especially in the Pontifical Council, the World Council of Churches, the process went on anyway. This proves that the project that has come to an end today is not a project bound to certain people, but a joint need of the whole Christian community and a great achievement of institutions working together over time. Keynote addresses from the three partners behind this document. And we first invite uh, Your Eminence, uh, Cardinal Turan, the President of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, to address us. Dear friends, if you allow me to treat you as friends, I think everybody of, in this room is aware that, in a way, we are making history this afternoon. <clears throat> Today represent an historical moment in our shared Christian witness. This is the first time that a document has been issued by the World Council of Churches, together with the World Evangelical Alliance and the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. It took over five years to reflect upon and to produce this short document. The purpose of my intervention is to share some consideration inspired by the recommendations for conduct. My first consideration will be to say that in spite of our divisions, we Christians have the duty to proclaim our faith without any compromise. The second will be that um, the Christian message has to be proclaimed, but never imposed. And the third consideration will be that religious leaders have the duty to propose a pedagogy of dialogue. In spite of our divisions, we Christians have the duty to proclaim our faith without any compromise. It can be difficult at this moment because we are living in societies at least in Western societies, which are organized themselves without God, and sometimes, we must tell that, sometimes even against God. There is also a great difficulty as regard the transmission of moral and religious values to the young generation. But we mustn't be discouraged by the complexity of the task, because we know that the Holy Spirit guides our activities. The Spirit reveals the times, places, and instruments which we need in the work of proclaiming the Gospel. We are called by the same Spirit to enter into the realm of significant historical and cultural change in order that we may seize the opportunity to respond in faith. As from the earliest days of Christian witness, we too believe in the Kairos. Consequently, Christians' witness is facing new challenges, which are putting accepted practices into question. In a word, a situa the situation is requiring Christian communities to consider in a new way how best to proclaim the Christian faith. As religious leaders, we have to engage and to form our fellow believers in a process of ongoing conversion. It means that we have to think, to program our life, and to take engagements according to the gospel values. We are not teachers. We are not teachers giving lessons about God, no. We are messengers of salvation, brought to us by Christ's death and resurrection. We will, we, we are still living today, hence the importance which the following the principles in the recommendation for conduct place on each of the following elements of our common mission. Acting in God's love, imitating Jesus Christ, Christian virtues, acts of service and justice, discernment in ministries of healing, rejection of violence, freedom of religion and belief, mutual respect and solidarity, respect for all people, renouncing false witness, ensuring personal discernment, and building interreligious relationship. As our shared history has taught us, a lack of prudence and respect for others 
leading to inappropriate means of proclamation of good news, unavoidable, uh, unavoidably brings interreligious tensions, even violence and the loss of human life. Christians, too, are sometimes involved in these conflicts, whether voluntary or involuntary, and involuntarily, either as those who are persecuted or as those participating in violence. I am convinced that these recommendations for conduct will help us reduce unnecessary tensions and to present the truth of God in a credible way to the world around us. Our greater willingness to renew together our efforts to meet the challenges which today's society and cultures places before us will in fact enhance the very quality of our Christian witness. And it will speak more eloquently than my words, that, that any words of the gospel of hope which inspires our concern for the world around us. The second consideration is the Christian message has to be proclaimed but never imposed. There may be some who will try to find a hidden agenda for our renewed missionary activity. But let us be clear, the document which we publish today, which is rather than to encourage people in a pluralistic world to live together in a better climate of mutual dialogue and respect and sincere friendship, it is an invitation to humanity to search for the ultimate truth. And you remember that the Declaration Nostra Aetate of the Second Vatican Council, especially in paragraph two, affirms the work of all religion to counter the restlessness of the human heart, each in his own manner, by proposing a way of life comprising teachings and sacred rites. And the Catholic Church, say the text, rejects nothing that is true and holy in these religions. She regards with sincere reverence those ways of conduct and of life, those precepts and teachings which, though differing in many aspects from ones she holds and sets forth, nonetheless often reflect a ray of that truth which enlightens all humankind." End of quotation. Our temple and headquarters have to be the new so-called courtyards of the Gentiles, to use the expression of the Acts of the Apostles, which is dear to Pope Benedict XVI. A place of prayer that is for all people. As a matter of fact, we must <clears throat> offer space, persons, and reflection for all those who are looking for God, who desire the pure and the great, and even, and even if God remains for them the unknown God, it is therefore important that together with ecumenical intelligence dialogue, there be programs for those whom, to whom religion is something foreign, to whom God is unknown, yet who nevertheless do not want to be left merely godless. For our new attitude of Christian witness, the image of the courtyard of the Gentiles reminds us that Christians might never forego a sense of boldness in proclaiming the gospel and in seeking every positive way to provide avenues for dialogue where people's deepest expectation and their thirst for God can be laid bare in honest conversation. This boldness allows the question of God to be addressed by sharing one's personal experiences in seeking God and recounting this gratuitous nature of one's personal encounter with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This will firstly require self-evaluation and purification so as to recognize any traces of fear weariness, confusion, or retreat on account of the cultural milieu in which one finds ourself, oneself. This step must immediately be followed by renewed efforts and initiatives, relying on the grace of the Holy Spirit to experience God as Father, which in turn can then be communicated to others in virtue of our personally encountering Christ in whom we see the face of God. Love is the key word inspiring our dialogue. Speaking last week in Rome, Pope Benedict reminded us that what Jesus gave us in the upper room, we openly display because the love of Christ is not reserved for the new, but is intended for everyone. It's not reserved for the few, sorry, but is intended for everyone. Interreligious dialogue between believers is a promising opportunity to openly display the word of love 
which Christ wishes us to share. This dialogue can also prompt us to learn how the major challenges we are discussing here today are seen in other religions, thus allowing Christianity to understand more deeply the ways with which the Christian faith can listen and res can respond to each person's deep religious sense. Christian life and practice can guide this reflection, not least of all by devising new models of being Christian communities while avoiding the dangers of sectarism and or merely civic religion. And the third conviction of mine is, as religious leaders, we are entrusted with promoting a pedagogy of dialogue. We have to be vigilant that our communities do not lose their capacity to remain close to people in their daily lives, so as to announce in that very place the life-giving message of the gospel. At a time when choosing faith and following Christ are difficult and little understood, if not indeed openly questioned and contradicted, the task of the community and of every Christian must be undertaken with greater intensity, namely be witnesses and heralds of the gospel after the example of Christ. Peter, the head of the College of the Apostles, gave precious recommendation which is still valid today. We are called to provide reasons for the hope that is within us, but we have to do it with gentleness and reverence. The word of good love, which we together wish to proclaim within the courtyard of the Gentiles, is the word that speaks of peace. Yes, we make statements and declarations, but the word that leads to peace is spoken best in action. In order to become the protagonist of a new humanism, we must learn to live together in diversity, where we are not afraid of what is different from our way of thinking or believing. It is important to realize that peace is the name of the common future of men and women and of the world. We commit ourselves today, gathered as we are as fellow Christians, to keep God's commandments and to serve him in our calling. Yet we are faced with the danger of relativism and fundamentalism, both of which threaten fundamental human values. As we have noted, there are some who, know, who now seek to exclude religious belief from public discourse, to privatize, it, to privatize it, or even to paint it as a threat to equality and liberty. Yet religion is in fact a guarantee of authentic liberty and respect, leading us to religion is in fact a guarantee um, of authentic liberty and respect, leading us to look upon every person as a brother or sister. Society needs today clear voices which propose our right to live, not in a jungle of self-destructive and arbitrary freedoms, but in a society which works for the true welfare of its citizens and offer them guidance and protection in the face of, the, of their weakness and fragility. How much we need in our communities and in society, witnesses of the beauty of holiness, witnesses of the splendor of truth, witnesses of the joy and freedom born of a living relationship with Christ. When we can convincingly and together take on board the age-old challenge which St. Peter's placed before us to give forth reasons for the hope that is within us, then we'll offer, we will offer to the world a living faith which liberates our minds and enlightens our efforts to live wisely and well, both as individual and as member of society. A great Jesuit missionary in China in the 16th century, Father Matteo Ricci, um, proposed a method of interreligious dialogue in, of great simplicity, but I think we can inspire us and help us as Christ's disciples. He wrote, the purpose of making friends with someone is to exchange goodness with him. If this goodness exceeds mine, I learn from it. If my goodness exceeds his, I teach him. 
Building relationships, you will have observed, is one of the key elements of this recommendation for conduct, which we are publicly endorsing here today. Our friendship as fellow Christians with people of other religions and with all, peop and with all people of goodwill can serve us well to learn from each other's goodness. After all, we model our life on the example of Christ himself to say, I do not call you servants anymore, I call you friends. As he has called us friends, so too the way of friendship can become the path we take to speak the word of love and build the path of peace. Dear friends, Archbishop Pierre Luigi de Celata, Monsignor Andrew Tania Nan, and Monsignor Juan Fernando Usma, representing the Pontifical Council for Christian Unity, and myself, are aware of the significance of our meeting today. Remembering the disappointments and also the blessings which have marked our common journey, we entrust this recommendation to the Lord. Confident in his providence and in the power of the Holy Spirit, it is my hope that this new document will inspire opportune reflections and initiatives at the grassroots level of our communities. Therefore, when so many of our brothers and sisters seem to be lost before the riddles of life, we shall help them to discover that we are all pilgrims walking towards someone who is waiting for us, Jesus. Jesus who says, I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The Secretary General of the World Evangelical Alliance to address us. Well, good afternoon. Um, your Eminence, Excellencies, Excellencies, Sisters and Brothers, Friends, it's a great delight to be with you this afternoon at this momentous occasion. And before I make my remarks, I want to uh, provide you a picture in your mind, what I believe illustrates what's taken place in these last number of years. Several years ago in the country of Honduras, uh, during several days there was, uh, there was 200 inches of rain that came down. It caused tremendous flooding. And when the waters receded, there was something interesting that happened. Uh, there was a bridge that had been built that crossed the river, built by great Japanese engineers. When the waters receded, the river was no longer running under the bridge, and the roads running, uh, connecting the bridge were no longer in existence. So here was a bridge that was really not crossing the river anymore. There was a need for a new bridge. And I want to suggest to you today that in the last five years that we have been building a new bridge, a bridge that hasn't been there before, where we've been developing new maps, a direction that has been unchartered, and, but today I think we're developing a new bridge of relationships between these three world bodies, and it's with great gratitude that we're here today as a part of this. When the Evangelical Alliance was established in 1846, it sought to work in, three, in four primary areas of concern. Christian unity, human rights, and in particular that of the abolition of slavery, world evangelism, and religious freedom for all. Today we find ourselves with the joyous announcement of a document that fulfills all four of these concerns. Christian unity, human rights, a positive outlook of mission and evangelism, and a major step towards religious freedom. These are all part of the significance of the document, Christian Witness in a Multi-Religious World, Recommendations for Conduct. The World Evangelical Alliance, representing over 600 million Christians worldwide, is grateful that the World Council of Churches and the Roman Catholic Church have accepted us as collaborators in the process of developing these recommendations. 
missionary zeal as a sign of obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ has always been a cornerstone belief for evangelicals. And so it is a special privilege to have had the opportunity to work with these colleagues on such a document. It is our hope that with this text, what we will learn together to practice our obedience better, to witness more and to be more faithful to Christ in our witnessing. Surely this brings joy to the heart of God. The process itself has been very significant. It has brought together expert theologians and practitioners from all around the world to discuss challenge, learn, and work together in ways that we have not seen before. There has been great openness and genuine co cooperation over these past five years. And I want to recognize here the women and the men who have worked so hard to draft, edit, and revise this text with the result that we have an extraordinary piece of work before us. Without their exceptional labor and dedication to, make, to making this happen, we would not be here today. So thank you. The recommendations with its three main sections, a basis for witness, principles and recommendations, covers very succinctly the essence of Christian mission, and in doing so, calls, us, calls all of us back to the person and work of Christ. We might be surprised that the document does not say anything new. After all, it states what many would consider to be obvious to the core of Christian mission. And yet, it has never been said before in this way, at least, at least not so clearly and not without within the context of collaboration between three Christian families of faith that jointly represent about 90% of all Christians on the planet. This is a powerful document. There is no genuine Christian mission without ethics. And there can be no Christian ethics without the, an affirmation of human dignity. The recommendations cover all of these. It is a code of ethics for all Christians, especially those living and serving in context of religious diversity. It is an affirmation of the dignity of God's creation. And it is a reminder to every Christian and every Christian organization that mission is at the heart of the gospel. Without mission, the church is dead. But such mission must always be carried out in accordance with the demands Jesus places upon us. Demands for justice, for peace, for respect, for truthfulness, and humility. Thus, following Jesus and carrying out God's mission on earth are not in conflict with works of justice or those who struggle on behalf of human dignity, but belong together. The two go hand in hand. We witness to Christ in word and deed, and both must be done according to the example set up for us by Jesus himself. The recommendations make this clear and beautifully point us to prayer as an essential part of our, of our lives and our calling within God's mission. The document is a major achievement for world mission and evangelism. It affirms our calling to witness as a joyous task and that through such witnessing, we are made participants in the mission of God. The document is also a major achievement for religious freedom and human rights. It calls on all Christians to re-examine their own practices in the light and the life of the teachings of Jesus. And it shows us that part of our fidelity to the gospel entails speaking out and working for justice and freedom of all people in every place. It is a major achievement in our relationship with those of other religions. It recalls that our Lord is the Prince of Peace and that his, as his people, we are called to live in peace. Through such peacemaking, we bear witness to Christ and demonstrate the respect that we should have towards all people. The document is a major achievement in the political arena. It shows to gov the governments of the world that Christians are not only able to work together, but that together we are an even stronger voice on behalf of those who suffer oppression and persecution. It is also a major, major achievement in Christian unity. 
it has brought together Christians from different backgrounds and traditions, and with the grace of God and the help of the Holy Spirit, has enabled these people to work together on a text that will be of service to all, all churches and to all Christians worldwide. The leaders of the World Evangelical Alliance fully endorse this text and urge all of our member alliances and international partners and churches to study and reflect and use this document within the, the particularities of their context. It has been an honor and a privilege to work with our colleagues in the Roman Catholic Church and the World Council of Churches towards the production of this splendid text. And we hope that this is just the beginning of many of, of such collaborative efforts. We know that our witness is made stronger and more truthful to the extent that we work together for the glory of God's reign. This is a historic docu document, a historic moment, and a time for Christians to awake once again to our calling to mission and unity, always bearing in mind the ways in which Jesus calls us to do so. I am thankful to all those who contributed to making this happen. But our thanks go primarily to God who has made this possible, despite our failures and shortcomings. And we pray that God may visit us all in grace and power, renewing our faith and our vision, our hope and our resolve so that we can indeed bear witness to Christ in this generation and throughout the world. Thank you very much. It's my honor to present some perspectives and some words of hope from the World Council of Churches as we are hosting this, but also as we are a partner in this event. The Christian witness demands Christian attitudes. The Christian word of the gospel demands Christian values. We have in this document, the Christian witness in a multi-religious world, presented some reflections, some recommendations, what this means in practice in today's world as ecumenical partners and as fellow disciples of Christ. These three bodies we represent, in a way also representing then a huge number, maybe two billion Christians. We are, with this document, presenting the core values and the core message of our Christian faith. This itself is a testimony to our search for Christian unity. And it is something I think we should thank God for most of all, but also thank one another for the willingness to do this. When we work together as churches and Christians, we can be another body together. We can have another witness together. And we can give the good message, the good news of the gospel, another strength. We are called to commit ourselves to work with all people in mutual respect, promoting together just peace and the common good. I believe that this document also in a new way express what we in the World Council of Churches in many ways now reflect on what is just peace. God's righteousness and God's peace is why we are here. It's why we are saying this together. We have something to bring to the world together. God's righteousness and God's peace recommends that we reflect on how just peace also can be brought to the world through our Christian witness and through our Christian attitudes we are able to show together. We do think and hope that we represent these values and these attitudes 
in most of what we do as churches in the world today. However, we also do know that that is not always the case. And we do not pretend that Christians have always behaved to the standards throughout history we are here representing and presenting. And that even today there are examples of Christians who engage in inappropriate methods of exercising mission. Therefore, we need one another to ask these questions to one another. This mutual exercise of asking, of criticizing others and ourselves is a very important part of the ecumenical movement. And the themes we are raising today about mission and about our witness to our peoples of other faith have been at the core reflection, at the, at, at the core uh, agenda of reflection of the World Council of Churches for many years. And we are very happy to do this now together with you as our partners. The World Council of Churches and the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue began to work on these issues, addressing best practices in Christian witness, particularly in this multi-religious context we all find ourselves to be in. And we were delighted to invite the World Evangelical Alliance to collaborate in this work. And we are very grateful for the commitment you all have shown to this initiative. The consultation process involved listening respectfully and attentively to our interfaith partners as well from around the world, to our fellow Christians and to particularly those who live in multi-religious contexts. We identified some of the serious issues associated with Christian mission and conversion. Based on this research, a team of writers, theologians and practitioners drawn from the three bodies and from across the world, from many countries in the world, drafted and redrafted these recommendations. And we are thankful to all of you who have been involved. We send out this document now to our different constituencies around the world with the hope and with the prayer that our member churches in the World Council of Churches, together with you, whom you represent, will see this as a contribution and as an inspiration. We will invite them to urge and invite and urge them to study these recommendations and to work with the Roman Catholic Church and partners related to the World Evangelical Alliance to reflect on what this means. In a spirit of interreligious dialogue, to produce their own codes of conduct relevant to their own contexts. We wish to see more Christian witness carried out, particularly among the poor and the marginalized people in the world. And as Christian believers, we are sent in mission to witness in the world and in our action to the love of the triune God. But I think this document and this process can help us to do this better and more united and with a stronger voice together. We do this with full respect and love for all human beings. We want to serve God and God's world and the people who God loves in this world. We wish to serve in a way that more clearly shows that love, justice, and peace are gifts of our common God and our common creator. Jesus Christ is the supreme witness of this love of God. And the Christian witness is always a share in his witness. Let us also express the hope that this document will be a good platform for reflections with peoples of other faiths about the common values we want to have when we talk together, when we live together, when we share our faith together. May God bless our churches, may God bless our witnesses, and may God bless our common witness today and tomorrow. Thank you. For almost 35 years, since 1977, there have been various forms of collaboration between the World Council of Churches through its program on interreligious dialogue and cooperation, or 
IRDC and the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue or PCID of the Holy See. This year has been marked by unknown joint staff meeting and reflection on interreligious themes. This, ref this reflection has been fruitful, resulting in several common projects in our shared concern to further the important work of proclamation and interreligious dialogue. I believe that the joint ecumenical document we launching today is indeed one of many our masterpieces. With the collaboration of the World Evangelical Alliance, which was invited to join us, it is the most significant document produced by the choice effort of our organizations. Living in Rome, the eternal city means being the home of some of the greatest masterpieces in human artistic mind has created. Every masterpiece requires not just imagination or desire, but careful craftsmanship of time. The few pages of this document we produce have revived five years of artistry and labor. Each sentence and each single word reflects our hopes and aspiration. Certainly, there have been many people involved in the process of produ pr production the this sensitive document. Without their prayers, Patience, perseverance, and prudence in collaboration, we would not be here today to unveil this work in the hope that the Lord will bless the efforts of our hearts and minds as we continue our work together. Earlier today, uh, Professor Thomas, Dr. Dr. Thomas Schumacher, give us an overview of the five-year process of uh, produ pro pro producing this document. Allow me now to express our heartfelt gratitude to the key persons who play such a significant role during those five years. Above all, our thank sincere thanks and gratitude go to the present three superiors of our respective institution, namely to His Eminent Karinan Zhang Lui Tohong, President of the PCID, Dr. Olaf Twice, Secretary General of the WCC, and Dr. Jeff Tunicliff. Gen Secretary General of the WEA, your extensive support, your why, your guidance, and your green light have made our project possible and have created us to reach the goal and has brought us here today. We continue to count on your wisdom and guidance as we continue to work. We have begun. Thank you very much to you. I go back to in uh, 2005 on the occasion of the unknown meeting between the WCC and PCID that very important person is Reverend Dr. Han Ukko present here and the PCID that time Archbishop Fitzgerald and also together with uh, Archbishop Gelata that time also there and uh, my predecessor Monsignor Felix Machado, that we start the question, the controversy, con con controversy about the conversion, etc. That Dr. Thomas mentioned already. That is why it is the it was the starting point for initiative project of interreligious reflection, and it developed until today. And later on, 
seemed to be Kari Nan Pupal, uh, Archbishop uh, Fritjela's successor as the president of PCID, that is on PCID side. And from WCC also have Reverend Jack Matai here, present, I see somewhere, oh, here. And Mrs. Yvette Milos Milosevic from WCC. And that time also seem to me have, not seem, but it is indeed. Bishop Tony Rich, Richie, that from, seem to be only one person represent uh, Pentecostal that starting to, uh, the, this uh, process. That he also, I mean, Bishop uh, Tony Rich, also a member of the WCC International Affairs Commission, took up the same issue. In many ways, all of you are real architects of this project and are deserving our sincere thanks. Our thanks are also due in no small measure to those uh, participants, 27 person international participants for the first consultation in 2006, as well in Laliano, Italy, and also to the uh, 45 representatives of various denominations who took part in the second consultation organized in Toulouse, 2007. Both consultations provide us with much reflection and in fact set the course of this document for recommendation for conduct. Almighty and ever-living God, we brothers and sisters in Christ from various ecclesial traditions, obedient to your command, renew our commitment to preach the gospel of the kingdom throughout the world, in words and deeds, respecting our neighbors and loving them as Jesus Christ, our Lord, has loved us. Give us the courage and wisdom to win this properly to our Christian faith in a multi-religious world, recognizing the seeds of truth sown by the Holy Spirit and giving testimony to Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Certain that the Spirit blows where the Spirit wills and confident that God will grant assistance to all our brothers and sisters we echo a prayer of the ancient church attributed to St. Augustine. Breathe in us, O Holy Spirit, that our thoughts may all be holy. Act in us, O Holy Spirit, that our words too may be holy. Draw our hearts, O Holy Spirit, that we love only what is holy. Strengthen us, Holy Spirit, to defend that which is holy. Guard us then, O Holy Spirit, that we always may be holy. Amen. Thank you. And by this, the launching of this document is a reality. It is uh, available for anybody to read and to study. And in 10 minutes there will be a press conference here and anybody are welcome to stay in the hall but we have to rearrange a little bit. But ACTA is finished. <laughs> so far. Thank you. Thank you.